secondary research methods, which often encompass the examination of statistics, documents, and prior research, provide a pivotal foundation in the world of academic and industry research. These methods leverage previously collected and published data to glean new insights, inform decisions, or provide context to primary findings. In today's discussion, we will delve deep into the intricacies of these methods, offering clear explanations and citing illustrative example studies. While secondary research offers numerous advantages such as cost-effectiveness and time-saving capabilities, it is not without its limitations. By understanding both the strengths and weaknesses of these approaches, researchers and professionals alike can harness their potential to the fullest, ensuring accurate and impactful results. Join us as we embark on this enlightening journey. The first type of secondary data is official statistics. Official statistics refer to datasets meticulously compiled and made public by government entities or organizations. These are primarily derived from large-scale methodological investigations such as surveys, administrative archives, censuses, and other sanctioned procedures. Such statistics are conveniently accessible, for instance, via platforms like the Office of National Statistics website. Examples of official statistics include the population census, which is completed every 10 years, the crime rate which is published quarterly, intermittent declarations of unemployment figures, and the quantifications of a nation's gross domestic product, GDP. For those engaged in sociological inquiry, these statistics are invaluable. They offer exhaustive data, guaranteeing an extensive and representative dataset. They are economical, removing the need for researchers to incur substantial costs associated with primary data acquisition. Moreover, the standardized methodologies adopted for their collection ensure consistency and reliability, facilitating longitudinal assessments and temporal comparisons. Furthermore, the fact that they can be accessed through formal platforms such as the Office of National Statistics bestows a certain level of transparency, ensuring that researchers, irrespective of their affiliation, can readily obtain them. However, when utilized in sociological frameworks, these statistics have inherent constraints. The predominantly quantitative character of official statistics may neglect the intricate qualitative dimensions, potentially failing to encapsulate the complexities and subtleties of societal dynamics. There also exists a possibility for validity discrepancies. For instance, declared crime rates may not encompass the latent figures of crimes that remain unreported. Moreover, the influence of political motivations or biases can impact these datasets' accumulation, interpretation, or explanation, which may distort the actual representation. Also, notwithstanding their comprehensive nature, these datasets could become obsolete, particularly in rapidly transforming sociological landscapes. This, however, can work in the sociologists' favor as it allows them to see trends emerging over long periods of time. Next is unofficial statistics. Unofficial statistics are those that are generated outside official governmental circles. Instead, they spring from a variety of sources like private research studies, newspapers, NGOs, or academic institutions. For instance, if an NGO concerned with environmental conservation conducted a survey in a particular city to understand residents' views on recycling habits, this would generate unofficial statistics. Similarly, when a student group in a university undertakes a research project to understand the impact of social media on mental health among their peers, the data they collect also falls into this category. These statistics are particularly valuable in sociological research because of their diversity and specificity. Governmental bodies often prioritize broad societal indicators, like unemployment rates or GDP growth, due to their wide-ranging implications. In contrast, unofficial statistics can address more localized or niche concerns. They offer a degree of flexibility in their collection and methodology which can be tailored to address specific questions or concerns, providing potentially more nuanced insights. Furthermore, since unofficial data collection is not bogged down by bureaucratic red tape, the findings can be more current. This immediacy can be especially important in rapidly evolving situations, such as tracking sentiments during a social movement 
or understanding immediate public reactions to a new policy. Moreover, the less rigid structures can also allow for innovation in data collection methods, incorporating, for example, digital tools or social media analytics. However, this flexibility and informality can also be a double-edged sword. Without the standardized methodologies that official data sources employ, the reliability and consistency of unofficial statistics can be suspect. Imagine two different NGOs conducting surveys on the same topic but coming up with varying results due to differences in their sample selection or survey questions. This can make it difficult to establish a universally accepted figure or perspective on a particular issue. Additionally, unofficial statistics can sometimes have a limited scope, focusing on smaller sample sizes or specific demographics. While this might offer detailed insights, it poses challenges when trying to generalize these findings to a broader population. There's also the ever-present specter of bias. An organization with vested interests might, even unintentionally, skew data collection or representation to align with their objectives. Lastly, the absence of a regular and systematic collection pattern means that tracking changes over time using unofficial sources can be problematic. To navigate this landscape, it's essential for researchers to exercise discernment. Understanding the source of the data, their methodology, and potential biases will be crucial. While unofficial statistics can be a goldmine of rich, specific insights, they must be interpreted judiciously and in conjunction with other data sources to paint a comprehensive picture of societal trends and patterns. Documents are another type of secondary data that comes in the form of qualitative data. There are a number of different types of documents. The first is personal documents. Personal documents refer to written accounts created by individuals offering detailed insights into their personal experiences, thoughts, feelings, and social contexts. They are frequently utilized in qualitative sociological research to provide a first-hand perspective on various social phenomena. These documents can help illuminate both the intricacies of individual lives and the broader social structures they're a part of. Examples of these documents include diaries and journals, which chronologically detail an individual's experiences and emotions, offering a unique look into their daily lives. Letters and correspondence can provide insights into personal relationships, networks, and the social contexts of their respective times. Autobiographies and memoirs, being more reflective, provide broader overviews of lives, often shedding light on larger socio-historical contexts. In the contemporary digital age, social media posts and blogs have become increasingly relevant as they offer immediate glimpses into individuals' lives their interactions, and their opinions on larger societal issues. There are numerous strengths associated with using personal documents in sociological research. For one, they provide rich and detailed data, offering a depth of information that might be overlooked in more structured research methodologies. Their authentic nature captures genuine perspectives, providing a sincere look into people's experiences. Furthermore, certain documents like diaries can provide longitudinal insights, tracking changes and consistencies over extended periods. Additionally, given that these documents are pre-existing, it often means researchers can access them without the time and resources typically associated with primary data collection. However, there are also limitations to consider. These documents are inherently subjective, capturing only one person's perspective which might not be generalizable to larger groups. The potential for bias is another issue. Individuals might portray events or themselves in a specific manner, potentially omitting or exaggerating certain details. Sometimes, it's challenging to gauge a document's broader social or historical context without supplemental information. And of course, there's the matter of availability and access. Many personal documents might be private or simply inaccessible to researchers. Finally, given the subjective nature of these documents, interpreting them requires a discerning eye, recognizing potential biases and the nuances of personal narratives. Historical documents, as the name suggests, are records or writings that offer insights into past events, cultures, or individuals. They are secondary sources that have been created or written at the time being studied. 
In the realm of sociological research, these documents play a pivotal role in understanding the social dynamics, norms, and structures of past societies, shedding light on the evolution of social behaviors, institutions, and relationships. Examples of historical documents are manifold. One might consider ancient manuscripts, which detail the cultural, religious, and social practices of a bygone era. There are also governmental and administrative records, such as censuses, tax records, or court proceedings, which offer a systematic understanding of societal structures and hierarchies. Newspapers and periodicals from the past can provide a daily snapshot of life, illuminating societal concerns, opinions, and events of the time. Personal letters, though more intimate, can reveal the nuances of interpersonal relationships, aspirations, and challenges faced by individuals in a given society. Similarly, photographs, even though visual, tell a story of the past, capturing moments that represent broader societal realities. Turning to the strengths of using historical documents in sociological research, several points are worth highlighting. Firstly, these documents provide a direct link to the past. Unlike secondary sources, which are interpretations of these documents, historical documents are first-hand accounts, making them invaluable for original research. They also offer a holistic perspective, as they encapsulate not just major events but also the mundane details, giving researchers a comprehensive view of past societies. Moreover, they remain unaltered by contemporary biases or present-day interpretations, preserving the authenticity of the period they belong to. However, as with any research method, there are limitations. One of the primary challenges with historical documents is their potential incompleteness or degradation over time. This can result in gaps in information or a skewed representation of events. Also, these documents were typically produced by a specific subset of the society, often the elite or literate class, which could lead to a biased or narrow perspective of the past. The interpretation of these documents is another challenge. Historical contexts might differ greatly from our modern understanding, making it essential to approach these documents with a knowledge of the period's socio-cultural milieu. Lastly, while these documents offer a genuine glimpse into the past, they, too, are not devoid of biases. They were written or created by humans with their own perceptions, opinions, and motivations. Public government documents are official publications and records produced by governmental bodies or agencies. They serve various administrative, legal, and informational purposes and are made accessible to the public, often as a requirement for transparency, accountability, or public information dissemination. Within the realm of sociological research, these documents hold significant value as they offer structured insights into societal patterns, institutional structures, behaviors, and policies. Examples of such documents are myriad. Parliamentary records, which include transcripts of legislative debates and proceedings, can illuminate the decision-making processes and the socio-political dynamics of a given period. Other relevant documents might include policy papers, which offer insights into the government's stance on specific issues, national health and education reports, which detail societal well-being and priorities, and crime statistics which reflect societal challenges and patterns. The strengths of utilizing public government documents in sociological research are manifold. Firstly, these documents are typically systematic and extensive. They are created for administrative purposes and, as such, tend to be comprehensive in their data collection and presentation. Additionally, their standardized nature ensures consistency which is invaluable for researchers aiming to compare data over time or across different jurisdictions. They're also generally reliable, given that they undergo rigorous processes before publication and are easily accessible, often available online or in public libraries. However, alongside these strengths, there are inherent limitations. One of the principal concerns is the potential for bureaucratic bias. Government documents might, at times, reflect the priorities or biases of the ruling administration, which could influence the way data is presented or even collected. Additionally, while these documents offer vast amounts of data, they might not delve into the qualitative nuances or subjective experiences, which are often essential for sociological understanding. 
There's also the issue of potential gaps in data, as not every aspect of society will be documented or overlooked for various reasons. Lastly, interpreting these documents requires a certain level of expertise. Sociologists must be adept at understanding the context in which the document was produced and be cautious of potential pitfalls in taking the data at face value. In the world of sociological research, we never truly start with a blank slate. Prior research, often referred to as existing literature or a literature review, encompasses studies, findings, theories, and other analyses previously conducted and published in sociology. It's this collective body of knowledge that forms the bedrock for new studies, offering guidance, context, and depth to emerging research endeavors. Imagine a sociologist intent on delving into the intricate relationship between social media and body image among teenagers. Before undertaking a fresh study, they would ideally immerse themselves in existing research on related subjects. This could include older investigations on the media's influence on body image, contemporary studies about the overall effects of social media on young minds, or specific probes into online beauty standards. By engaging with this prior research, our researcher can identify areas yet to be explored, refine their hypotheses, and ensure their study contributes meaningfully to the ongoing academic dialogue. There are several clear advantages to using prior research in sociological studies. Firstly, it offers both foundation and context, allowing new research to be understood in light of what's already known, and enabling researchers to expand on established ideas. Furthermore, with a grasp of what's been done before, Researchers can identify what still needs investigation, ensuring their work remains relevant and avoids unnecessary repetition. There's also a matter of efficiency. Leveraging existing data or findings can save both time and resources, as one might repurpose already collected data to uncover new insights. Moreover, comparing new results with those from prior research can act as a validity check with consistent findings across different studies often strengthening confidence in the results. However, using prior research isn't without its challenges. Some research can quickly become outdated, especially in areas where societal shifts happen rapidly. Relying on such outdated data can lead to conclusions that may no longer hold true. Additionally, every piece of research carries its own biases, whether in the methods employed, the interpretation of results, or even in the framing of questions. Without a discerning approach, these biases can be unknowingly perpetuated in new research. There's also the possibility that existing research may not entirely align with the specific nuances or questions a new study seeks to address. Lastly, there's a risk associated with being overly tethered to established knowledge. It can sometimes stifle fresh perspectives or innovative avenues of exploration. So, there you have it. We have covered the main types of secondary methods used in sociological research. Quantitative methods like official and unofficial statistics. And qualitative methods such as documents. We have also looked at the importance of prior research. We have covered how they work, the different types and the strengths and limitations of using each method. You will revisit this as you go through each of the topics but this should provide you with a solid foundation. See you soon.